Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Damang Sangang Namasami There's a book I read several years ago that quite a few monastics have read and other practitioners I know called Peace Pilgrim. And it's the story of one of the figures I consider a giant in the American spiritual landscape and yet is largely or not well known, at least not as well known as she deserves to be. So the Peace Pilgrim was a woman who lived a fairly normal life with a good deal of faith. She was a devoted Christian until she was about, I think in about her 30s. And then in her telling of it, she heard a voice when she was about 30 or so, or at some point, I can't remember the exact moment when she heard. Do you remember, Arjun? And it told her to prepare for a larger spiritual task in her life. And she spent the next decade or two preparing herself. And when she was, I believe, a bit more up there in years, maybe 50 or so, she set out and wearing just a shirt that said Peace Pilgrim on the front and the back and carrying almost nothing except her toothbrush and some letters, she walked continuously back and forth across the country on a pilgrimage for peace. And she continued to walk. I believe she crossed the U.S. perhaps maybe seven or eight times over the course of several decades, just quietly spreading this message of peace. And she used no money, or rather she had no way of getting money. She would fast until she was offered food and she would walk until she was offered a place to sleep. And she speaks about how she would sometimes sleep on the pavement for three nights running and just walk hour after hour. I believe at one point, I mean, there are definitely days where she went without eating Um, At one point, while she wasn't walking, she just fasted for 40 days without ceasing. And she kept in her mind God this whole time and her path and mission, which was to spread this message of love. And she was unstoppable. In the Buddhist conception, we would say that her samadhi, her concentration was really strong. She kept this mantra of God in her mind constantly and it gave her a huge power. And you see this when you meet people who possess this degree of unification of mind, whether in a Buddhist context or a Christian or any other, is there's a brightness to them and a power they have this immense inner wealth which they can share. This is one of the reasons why it's false when people speak about practicing meditation as a selfish or self-involved act. What we're doing is cultivating skills, a way of of accessing an inner well-being and energy 
which lets us give to others. And when cultivated to a great extent, lets a woman walk unceasing for years with the single purpose of bringing care to those around her. And she was unafraid as well. She, um, there's numerous instances she speaks of in this book where she came very close to a lot of danger. One particular one comes to mind where a man stopped to pick her up and she got in the car with him and just fell asleep on his shoulder. And he just sat there stunned. And when she woke up, he said, look, I, I, I intended you harm, but I looked over at you sleeping and I, I couldn't touch you. I couldn't do anything. And he just sat in silence, moved by this courage in her. And, you know, she walked, she got out of the car and kept walking. And not to say that people should do this or like the danger, especially to women out there is to be taken lightly, but to say that whatever strength she had and whatever ability to trust she brought to those interactions. And there are many stories in this book of her seeing the good in people that even they had forgotten and them responding to it by becoming and acting out their best selves. And she touched so many people. And I know at least one monk who was brought to robes largely by reading her biography. It's for free online. You can Google it. Peace Pilgrim PDF. So why this is worth bringing to mind, I think, is there's a famous Sri Lankan monk who's passed now, who said that if you had to condense the whole of the Buddhist path to one Pali word, it would be Yava Deva, which means only for the sake of. And this phrase is the one that we use as monastics before we, we're supposed to recite it every day. So before we eat, we say, I take this food only for the sake of nourishing this body, of continuing the spiritual life. I use these robes only for the sake of keeping this body protected for modesty. I use this dwelling only for the sake of shielding myself from the elements. I use this medicine only for the sake of keeping the body reasonably healthy. So it implies a contentment with our material situation and understanding that enough is enough, that happiness won't be found there. So just giving it as much attention as it deserves and only, only that, and that we need far less than we think. But it implies something else. It asks the question, for the sake of what? And the answer, of course, is awakening. I think so much of the suffering of modern society is that we set our sights too low. Because something in us intuits that the usual goals of a middle class life are not enough to sustain a heart. And that's not to say that we don't get to live that middle class life with devotion and sincerity because that's a good life. But that can't be the only reason we live. That life is for the sake of awakening and cleansing and purifying the heart and of serving those around us. We reach through this life to touch something greater. And because the quintessential aspect in any intention and creation of karma in Buddhism is intention, 
by meditating and cultivating this ability to keep mindful, loving awareness directed in every act, we gain the ability to imbue every life, every act, with meaning because they are all become simply tools to purify ourselves, to make ourselves better servants of the world. And in this sense, that normal life, however mundane it might seem, is actually a transcendent journey towards something much greater. Ajin Kovilo were on, and I were on the bus this morning, and I think because of our, our culture has lost its canopies of meaning spiritually, this is one of the reasons why it holds up and places all that need for meaning on romantic love and career. So I don't know how many Hugh Grant movies there are out there, but we give such attention to that and such need for these other elements to fulfill us when they just can't. Because what these are good elements of a life, but the essential aspect has to be the spiritual path, always. So Ajin Kovilo and I were on the bus this morning, and the bus driver was just the kindest man. He was calling back to us, making sure we had the right stop. And you could see how every person he talked to was brightened by his presence. And on one level, people could dismiss his, his career as routine, usual, humble. But what he was using it for was the most transcendent purpose of a human existence. And in that sense, his career, his life was only for the sake of it only had to be that much, but it was for the sake of something far, far greater. So all this is context for a powerful but somewhat unpopular practice in Buddhism of body contemplation. This is the first foundation of mindfulness, Kayagatasati. And the Buddha praised it unceasingly. He said, just as the ocean holds the waters of all rivers, even so, one who develops mindfulness of the body partakes of all states that partake of true knowledge. He said, one thing, bhikkhus, monks, leads to great insight, great benefit, great sanctuary, great inspiration, a pleasant abiding in the here and now, awakening. What is that one thing? Mindfulness of the body. So that's confusing. Why exactly? Especially when you look at what mindfulness of the body implies. And on one level, it implies something as simple as learning to inhabit our bodies and developing a sense of the breath in the body through breath meditation. Most of us exist in our heads, and so learning to drop awareness into the heart through qigong, through tai chi, through cold showers, through exercise, and then through formal practice of meditation and specifically body scanning techniques. One specific one I bring to mind frequently is that spoke taught by Ajahn Jayasaro and Ajahn Suchitto, where you divide the body into three chambers and move awareness to the top chamber as you breathe for a time, just allowing yourself to feel the sensations of the breath up there and then relax them. Then dropping to the second chamber from the neck to the belly button, letting the awareness rest there for a time, and then dropping it to the third chamber from the belly button to the tailbone 
and just breathing, see, feeling the sensations there for a time, and then expanding awareness to hold the whole body, carefully tracking the breath at one spot while still remaining aware of the entirety. And if you do this over time, you do gain an awareness more of the body and you begin to inhabit it again. And not only do you access a pretty robust ballast for your emotional life, sensations and emotions can be drained into the body. So when anger comes up, instead of needing to release it through an act of yelling or expressing that anger, you can just imagine the energy draining down into the ground. Or like Ajahn Suchito says, when you, need to, when you feel yourself needing to power up into anger, power up right down into your feet. It's very helpful. Bring your awareness to the feet. Or when you feel your chest and breathing begin to tense and quicken with anxiety or fear or anger or greed, alter the pattern in the body of the breath. Relax it. Slow down. And watch as the accompanying mind state and thoughts also relax and dissipate. You can bring your awareness into your palms of your hands. Just feel them, their softness. You can relax your belly, relax your tongue. The other thing that mindfulness of the body allows then is access to a sweet and more innocent voice which resides in the chest, that what we call the chitta, which is that subtle sense of intuitive awareness that lets you know when something's not right or when it is right. And you can really feel this when you do something that's not in line with your highest aspirations or what you know you should do you'll feel the entire body weaken. It'll disintegrate, disintegrate. And you can feel this, you know, there's one monk in Japan who, when he's developing this minimalist lifestyle, if he's not sure if he should keep an object, he holds it in his hand and holds it to his chest. And if he feels weak, then he knows that he needs to just let go of the object. But if he feels okay, strong, he knows he can keep it because it's, it's okay. The body knows these things intuitively at times. So this is one sense of kayakata sati. But, and in the first foundation of mindfulness, the Buddha goes through many different practices, including breath meditation and others, including the sort of mindful awareness of all one's movements from waking to walking to turning to extending and contracting and bending one's limbs. But comparative studies that Bhante Analio has done between the Pali canon and the Chinese canon reveal that at its beginning, the first foundation of mindfulness of the body actually referred just to three contemplations. One was the elements. The second was the contemplation of the 32 parts of the body. And the third was the contemplation of the charnel ground contemplations of corpses in various states of decay. So these are a bit less romantic and much less romantic than, say, the practice of loving kindness, which is why they almost never get taught. The first of the elements is fairly tame, but the second two, in which you divide the body into its component parts, or the third, where you imagine a corpse in different states of decay are extremely off-putting to your modern meditator, frequently at first. But what all three are doing is trying to dissect the body 
in different ways so that we stop seeing it as this whole conglomeration or this whole entity and therefore attaching to it and gripping it. And as we do this, then we can see it more and more just as what the Christians have called it for millennia, which is a mantle of clay. We can see it just as a pair of, uh, a set of clothes we wear, our hearts wear. It's a tool to do good in this world and no more. And it is flawed and sick. As uh, Ajahn Kovilo and I found out recently, and as this whole world is finding out in uh, a somewhat, a way that hasn't had precedent for some time with the whole COVID epidemic, is seeing that these bodies really are frail and flawed. I remember going to the hospital in Thailand, which is much different than the hospitals in the US. In some ways, it's exactly the same, actually. But it's different in the sense that you have, in this hospital, 20 or 30 or 40 people all gathered together in one room. It was a public hospital, one long, large room. And you can smell what bodies smell like. And what I was struck by was the sense of betrayal that everyone was feeling when their bodies gave out, when they didn't behave, when they got sick, when they became injured, when they were in pain. And it was brutal because there was no preparation. People hadn't spent time before that moment of reckoning to learn to look at the body just as a flawed set of clothes that they wore and which would get sickened and would die. There's a sutta called the Nakula Pitta Sutta where this practitioner comes to the Buddha and says, I am ill, frail, old of age. My body is weak. And the Buddha says, it is so, Nakula Pitta, for who but out of mere foolishness would think this body healthy even for a moment? This body is frail, encumbered, subject to sickness. So you should train thus, though I will be afflicted in body, my mind will remain unafflicted, untouched. And this is the secret, is that if we are willing to look soberly at the body early in our lives, before things get bad, then even as it sickens, as it will, we don't have to be dragged down with it. Our minds don't have to be broken too. And more than that, just the immense pressure that society puts on our bodies, because none of our bodies are what we wish they were. At least, I don't know almost anyone who are. And with Cosmo magazine, especially for women, I think this is a brutal source of suffering that almost never stops. And if you can, and we, Ajahn Panyavado says, we tend to judge people about 90% from their bodies at first, what they look like. So the more you see through that, the more you see it as just this strange amalgamation of organs, of earth, of calcium, the more you can just see it as this veil that hides the brightness of someone's heart. And what a gift to be able to give yourself and others to look at to not judge them by their body, because whether someone's body is conventionally looked at as ugly or as beautiful, either one is brutal. I can imagine almost nothing harder than, you know, those people who are conventionally judged as beautiful, always wondering if someone likes them for their body or for who they are. So even though these three reflections in the body seem dour and can be dismissed as morbid, they aren't. We're just seeing the body as Yava Deva, only for the sake of. Just as the peace pilgrim 
just wore her sweater with the word Peace Pilgrim inscribed on it and just carried her toothbrush just as she used that clothing just to shield her body and to spread a message of peace. Even so, we wear this body only for the sake of spreading a message of peace, of practice. It's just that much. It's a tool. One we care for, but that's it. And this can be dismissed as cultivating bad body image. But we have to realize that negative body image is based on comparing your body to other bodies and seeing your body as lacking. Whereas what these contemplations do is see that all bodies are just kind of strange, awkward things. And there's not really much reason to compare yours to another because they're all flawed and only that much. It's actually a huge relief. So the first of these contemplation, the contemplation of the elements, um, involves looking at the body in terms of the earth element, which is the sense of solidity, or that part, those parts of it which are uh, solid. The water element, which is the fluid parts of it, either the sense of cohesion in it, in terms of sensation, or just looking at the liquid aspects of the body. The sense of fire, which is the warmth, the energy in the body, and the sense of wind, which is the sense of movement in the body. And these can seem like outdated categories, but intuitively, they're a very powerful way of dismantling the sense of self we imbue the body with. And it can be very helpful to combine these with the later contemplations about the decaying corpse, actually. If you just imagine your body after it dies, because it will, fading into the ground, the forest taking it back, slowly it becoming soil and then plants, becoming the earth element. And the water, the blood, evaporating, becoming rain and water, the earth element of it cooling, or the fire element of it cooling, giving your energy to nature, and the wind, the movement ceasing, and all that breath you've held your entire life being expelled, and you realize that you've just become again all those elements in nature. And in fact, you realize you never were different than that. We're only borrowing this body for a time. We take good care of it like we would a borrowed gift, but that's it. It's not ours. And the Buddha adds two other elements in some times, some of his lists, where he adds the consciousness element and the space element to make six. This can be very helpful in meditation. If you've been doing breath meditation or your mind has become very refined, but you find that intuitively you're still conceptualizing the body as just this frame, then the mind, once it's bright and refined, can feel constricted and constrained by that frame. So then it can be very helpful to turn your awareness to the space and consciousness elements. Imagine the space around you. Imagine not your consciousness held in the body, but rather your body held in consciousness. And this can release the mind from its sort of constriction and help it expand outwards. Ajahn Kovilo and I interviewed an amazing teacher named Ajahn Suchat two weeks ago in Thailand. Uh, we weren't in Thailand, but he is. We Skyped him. And it's on our YouTube channel. But we asked him what God was, if you had to define it. And he said, God is the six elements combining and dissipating. And we asked, what about the Nibbana element, the deathless element? What about that? 
And he said, the Nibbana element is contained in the consciousness element. I thought that was an amazing answer. I'd never heard someone say that. The latter two contemplations, the elemental contemplations are extremely difficult to sustain, I find, if you don't, unless you have a high degree of concentration, although some people do find them very helpful. But the other two contemplations of the 32 parts of the body and the charnel ground contemplations are a bit easier, but also a bit more we tend to be a bit more averse to them because they can seem kind of ugly. These are called the asuba contemplations, which means not beautiful. And it's not trying to see the body necessarily as ugly or something to be aversive to, but it's just seeing it as not terribly beautiful. So with the 32 elements, or the 32 parts of the body, uh, you can look this up, 32 parts of the body, and you'll see a list that the Buddha gave. Um, I think there's actually 31 in the original list, and then they added the brain later. But it goes to the skin, the teeth, the hair, the organs, the phlegm, the tendons. And it's just dissecting the body into its component parts. And usually you'll find one of those which really, if the mind is calm, and this is important, is for contemplations like this, the mind needs to be calm because you're seeing through a delusion that is very deep. Most of us know we're deluded about death. Our culture is full of stories of someone realizing they're going to die and then turning their life around. So we know we're missing something there. But our delusion about the body is so deep we don't realize that we're deluded at all. But you can feel it. In Thailand, you're built, bit by many mosquitoes. And just next time you're bit by a mosquito, watch your reaction to that. It's not just the bite of the mosquito, because that's not that bad. It's a sense of being violated. This is your body, and it's violating it. There's a sense of indignation, of, of trespass. So even in something as small as that, you can see your attachment to the body playing out, this hidden delusion. So what you want to do is you bring the mind to a state of calm and let it rest there as long as you can. And then as the mind begins to move again, you direct it to one of these contemplations. And if it leads to a sense of aversion and darkening of the mind, then it's not right then turn your mind to something bright, like metta or breath. But what should happen is the mind should become cool and bright because it's as if you're seeing through this mantle to something far deeper and more radiant in you. You're loosening your grip on it so that you can come closer to the intuitive brightness in you. That's, that should be the sign that you're doing it correctly. So as the mind begins to move again, you can move through those 32 parts, imagining the bones, the skin, the hair, and find the one that attracts you the most that you're interested in and raise it up. Frequently the bones will get people. Bones are very powerful, perhaps the most. But hair and skin and blood also tend to be attractive to people. And just contemplate that. You can sort of, you have to learn how to do it, but you can sort of make a little movie in your mind, feel your bones in your arm, feel them, imagine them. You can think of them as just calcium. I frequently try to recollect that my vertebrae are just so many stones. It's no different, really. And you can just come up with a phrase, either say bone, 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 or bones or stones. You just have to play with it, but find something that interests your mind. It'll, it, it'll feel interesting. And your mind will become brighter and brighter and brighter. And if you're really calm, you may have a moment where you look at your arm and you realize that it's just part of this world. 
It's just something you're borrowing. It's not you. It's not worthy of calling you. And when you see that, then the heart steps closer to what is. When we stop attaching to what we're not, to what's unworthy of our hearts, then our hearts come closer to what they are or closer to nibbana, closer to something. So this isn't a dower practice. But it isn't a terribly popular one for the obvious reasons. It's far more romantic to talk about metta than it is to talk about your spleen. But you really can recollect that in its essence, everything you see in the body of another, it's, it's all dead matter. The hair is dead. Even the skin is dead. If it were alive, then it would be too sensitive and it would hurt. The eyes look alive, but that's just because of moisture. So these are the type of contemplations we rarely talk about because it doesn't tend to go over terribly well. But the Buddha praised them, and it rips apart the sense of self in a nitty-gritty kind of way that so many high koans do not. And it attenuates every one of the defilements. It has to be used with care. But when you think of the rash of lust and sensual desire that sort of dominates our society, especially with the advent of pornography and of this constant focus on Tinder, on dating apps, on always looking for the next fix. And of all the damage that's done from people breaking trust, breaking faith with those they're in relationship with. It's very useful to have some tool in the tool belt to let you cool that fire a little bit, just a little, every now and again, so that when it does get overwhelming, you can really look at this body just as a body, as a conglomeration of earth, fire, air, water, or as just so many parts, as an innocent thing, but no more than a, a set of clothes that we wear and a tool only for the sake of something greater inside. It's not a dour vision of humanity or of who you are. It's rather letting the veil drop just a little bit, seeing through it so that you can see the face behind it, the heart behind it. The charnel ground contemplations, I'm almost hesitant to go into because they're really uh, a sort of don't use this at home kind of contemplation. But you definitely can if you're up for it. Um, what you do is you go through looking at the body in several states of decay, imagining the body after it's died, what will happen? It bloats, then it fades into the ground and fades away. And just you can imagine that sort of process occurring. So once again, these practices have to be used in tandem with brightening practices like breath and loving kindness. But it's useful to see them as means towards preparing for what will happen when the body does become ill, weak, when it ages, and eventually when it moves towards death. Because then, you know, we can get sick, but our mind isn't dragged down by that. And I've been around. You know, Ajahn Chah, when he got sick, someone who wants to ask Long Pasano what the greatest act of loving kindness he ever saw was. And he said that it was the fact that Ajahn Chah, who is the sort of father of our tradition, he became paralyzed. And he remained in that state of paralysis for about seven years. And Ajahn Pasano said that he believes that Ajahn Chah could have let go of his body at any time he was so well practiced, but that he sort of hung on for seven years or so. Because what happened was the community was able to sort of 
coalesce around him, to people were able to work out a new organizational structure so that the lineage could continue. So it allowed this sort of intermediate state between when Ajahn Shah was this charismatic leader and when the community had to step forward and form themselves. And Ajahn Shah was able to do that because he was able to see, be with the body with equanimity and use it as a tool towards something far greater, even when it was difficult. So that's what we aim for. And that can go for the mind as well. You know, people ask when dementia hits, will the practice affect you? Will it remain with you? And I think the answer really is yes. Long Por Fuong, Ajahn Jeff's teacher, got in this terrible car wreck and his mind was deeply affected or his brain was. And he told Ajahn Tanisaro, Ajahn Jeff, his student later, you know, my mind is faulty now, but that other thing I got in meditation, that remains, that hasn't changed. And when I first came to Seattle, I visited a Vietnamese monastery with this amazing abbot. He just had brain surgery and he could remember almost nothing. And yet he was the brightest spirit I have almost ever seen. So even as our minds go, if we've cultivated these contemplations, if we've cultivated it, something in the heart that doesn't go also, it remains. And even it's sort of like morning mist illuminated by sun. It is foggy and it's a little bit vague, but the sun illuminates it and ignites it. And just so even a mind that becomes a bit more vague, a bit more nebulous as we age, remains illuminated by the light of the heart and the chitta. And this is what body contemplation and this general realistic stance towards this form and this mind allows. So I wish you all the movement towards that same state and may you hold your life a bit like the Peace Pilgrim did with just your toothbrush and some letters and a, a pair, set of clothing, a life, which is just enough for the sake of something far greater. Sadhu, 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 anumodami. Okay, so I felt a bit self-conscious going into that talk. Um, <laughs> we usually don't talk about a suba practice for obvious reasons, but... Um, it is good to touch on every now and again, I think, just, just in case. Um, so we have some time for questions people would like to discuss or anything like that. Um, and Rahul, maybe you could see if the live stream, oh, it's done. Well, okay, <laughs> no worries. We'll upload it later. Do people have anything they'd like to talk about though? It can be on the talk or otherwise, Mark. <laughs> so the question is, are the jhanas necessary for insight? And uh, the jhanas are states of deep absorption uh, spoken about by the Buddha. There's four of them, plus four kind of formless higher attainments. So yeah, the jhanas are looking at the body in the three ways, like in the traditional description of the first foundation of mindfulness, it does include like breath meditation, which is one means of getting to jhana. Um, and a lot of the descriptions of jhana are very somatic. Like it speaks about, um, you know, the sense of sukha, of pleasure through the body, of 
a lot of the metaphors have to do with that. Um, so in that sense, the mindfulness of the body leads to these deep states of concentration. But the three practices that comparative studies say actually were the original first foundation of mindfulness, of elemental contemplation, of contemplation of the 32 parts of the body and of the charnel ground contemplations, those are all actually insight practices more, which means that they're, they're quite active. Um, I think there are ways of doing it. Like some people say, can use a body part as a mantra, like bones, 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 especially if you're a greed type, it helps a lot. Um, but usually what happens and what they recommend is that the mind, you want to get as deep into concentration as you can because the body becomes strong through movement and exercise. The mind becomes strong through resting and stillness. So you go as deep into concentration as you can, which aligns with what Ajahn Kovilo is saying with, there's not really a need to define exactly how deep you go. Just go as deep as you're able. And after you've rested in that state of bright, lucid, calm, lucidity of mind, there will come a point where the mind begins to move again. This, this will happen on a larger time scale during a period of retreat, is you might for several days or weeks even be able to like continually just approach calm. But then there will come a point either in a meditation session or in a retreat setting after say a few weeks where the mind, it's almost like you filled up that glass of samadhi and that you just can't fit any more in. Your mind only has room for so much at this point in your practice. And so the mind will begin to move again. And when it begins to move, that's when you direct it to these active insight practices of contemplating the body. And those deeper states of concentration, any state of concentration actually, will have sort of an afterglow of power in the mind. So that's why like someone can work in a hospital seeing, you know, decaying bodies constantly and still be completely, see, see nothing really. But if you've spent, you know, 20 or 30 minutes of a meditation in like a pretty good state of calm, and then the mind begins to move, and then you just think about bones, or you think about that cut you have on your finger, you know, and like really thinking about what that means. There's blood, there's skin, or thinking about your, you know, the hair as just this thing that kind of falls off. It's sort of dead matter. Like whatever captures your mind, and you sort of turn that around in your mind, um, then there comes a point where you see suddenly that it's not you. It, it's really, it's hard to articulate it, but it's, and it's not off-putting. It's just like, oh, well, that's odd. You know, like you start to see your attachment to it. And there should be a sense of brightness and cooling from that. And if you find yourself getting angry or sad or the next day angry, because it's a very powerful practice, the echoes can come later on then you, you don't want to keep doing it, um, at least not for a while. But uh, yeah, if your mind gets cool and bright, then that's good. And you just do that again and again and again over time, within measure, especially if you're a monastic. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the self and the defilements just get lighter and lighter. And you look through the suttas and breaking through the body, that attachment to the body is for a lot of practitioners, it's powerful enough that it leads to them to their first taste of enlightenment. It's supposed to be a very powerful insight. So yeah, but use it with caution. Um, but yeah, usually you use it after being in a state of calm for a time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, I think the you know, the fifth recollection of those after I'm of an age to age, die, is I'm the owner of my karma. And, and that's the escape hatch. That's the hopeful part. It's like, I have the ability to change my fate or to affect my everything through this, through my actions. So it's, a, you know, and, and it's interesting because the Buddha, in tandem with 
this path is full of these strange dichotomies of perception. Like, you know, if you sort of dismiss the body as just this much, it's like only looking at the, you know, only for the sake of. It's like only pu- looking at the only part. This body's only. We've got to remember for the sake of. And what this is for the sake of is so beautiful, especially when you see it embodied in someone, that the fact that the the body is this tool towards that ennobles it immensely. But it, it also doesn't have anything to do with this huge, brutal overlay of like the, co- uh, the cosmetics industry in the US is insanely, it takes so much money. I mean, we could feed the world several times, you know, educate the world several times over like with that or something like that, you know, or like how much how people just brutalize themselves over their body image, how they judge each other. I mean, that's what we're trying to get below. And, um, you know, and, and in tandem with these contemplations of the body, the Buddha has all these lovely contemplations about precious human rebirth. Like, what a gift to have this spiritual life, to have these friends, to have this teaching, to have this opportunity to have good health, to be, you know, so... You do have to hold both in the same time, and you have to hold them wisely, but they're both true. You know, I mean, we don't get to shy away from reality as Buddhists. Like, you have to figure out how to wisely, carefully hold it. Um, because this booty, will, the body will fail, you know. Um, but you bring up a good point. It could definitely be held wrong, and I've seen that happen. And it's actually a really famous story in the Buddhist canon of, like, a bunch of monks got really depressed from doing this contemplation too much. and. Uh, basically the Buddha, that's why he taught them breath meditation. So, yeah, if you start to get, yeah, you've got to use it carefully. And that's wise that you see that because it can go wrong, definitely. Yeah. This is a bright path, you know. If anything's leading you to sort of these dour mind states, it's not what you need to be holding up at the time. It's just the Buddha gives us a lot of different tools to use, you know. Really good point, Teresa, though. I think we might be done, time-wise. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Can we, uh, well, gosh, yeah, I think we're, we could, um, does anyone have anyone like they'd like to spread merit to, um, think of or call to mind who's suffering a bit or having a hard time at the moment or who passed recently? Okay. We could uh, give a blessing or do a chant. What would you like, Arjun? Sure. Yeah. Which one? Okay, great. So this is just a brief rejoicing and everyone coming together, even in this era of COVID and an auditorium that smells a little bit strange and. Uh, yeah, we're just appreciative of everyone in Sajin Kovila's last day, so yeah. Sabitio Ivajantu Saburugo Inasadu Mate Bovat Wonder Hayosuki Dika Yukobova Abiwadana Sili Sani Changwuda Pacha Ino Chataro Dhamma Vadanti Ayu Vano Sukang Balang Rakantusabha Mangalang Rakantu Sabha Devata Sabha Buddha Nubhavena Sarasoti Bhavan today Bhavatu Sabha Mangalang Rakantu Sabha Devata Saba Dhamma Nubhavena Sarasoti Bhavan today Bhavatu Saba Mangala Rakantu Saba Devata Saba Sangha Nubhavena Sarasoti Bhavan today Okay, so I... Uh,